Okay, I have a new guest with me today to discuss the Russia-Ukraine situation as we move potentially closer to World War III with events that have come out, uh, coup attempts, things like that. Uh, I have brought on former CIA Larry Johnson to help me make sense of this crazy world that we live in. Larry, so, uh, so grateful for you coming on today's show. Thanks, Stephen. Good to be with you. Yeah. So the first thing I, I want to talk about is uh, this is a big week for NATO uh, having their big meeting. And it was a little bit rocky with uh, Zelensky having a little bit of a meltdown over not being allowed to enter NATO at this time. Uh, do you think there is uh, any reason why NATO would allow Ukraine to, to join the alliance, because as I see it, uh, Zelensky is probably thinking, wait a minute, if, if we're inducted into NATO, that either shuts Russia down or gives us this huge network of people that will immediately go to war. On right. the other hand, I believe NATO nations are like, wait a minute, if we let you in right now, we're immediately opening up World War III. What are your thoughts on this situation? Well, I'm, I'm shocked that Biden, and it looks like Olaf Scholz of Germany, actually got something right, where they said that if we, if we bring in Ukraine now while it's fighting Russia, then according to Article 5 of the uh, NATO Charter, uh, the rest of NATO would be obligated to enter the war against Russia. And were that to happen, that would likely result in a, in a nuclear exchange with Russia coming out on top of that exchange and Europe being just a smoldering mass of ruins, including the United States. So they don't want to go that far. And yet they continue to provoke and openly uh, assault Russia by, by publicly declaring the weapons they're, they're going to send and how much aid they're going to give. If you think back during, during the Vietnam War, the Soviet Union was providing military assistance, significant military assistance to the North Vietnamese. But they weren't doing it publicly. They weren't rubbing it in our face. Similarly, we were providing ample covert military aid to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan during that war against the Soviets. So there's one way that you know the superpowers, the, the Soviet Union and, uh, and the United States back then learned how to play these games where they would provide military aid and assistance without disrupting their diplomatic exchange and without uh, closing off negotiations. What the West is now doing is by being so overt about this and that these weapon systems are killing Russian citizens. And we had during the summit, uh, both Germ uh, France and the United Kingdom announced that they're going to supply long-range cruise missiles that are capable of striking inside Russia. And what, what that means is if, if they do that, uh, Russia may be compelled to strike against France and the United Kingdom, against military bases or the factories that produce those weapons. So this has the potential really to spiral out of control. Uh, the, the other sort of dynamic that's going on here, though, is NATO's frantic. It's desperate because you not, it didn't matter how much intelligence they provided to Ukraine, how much military equipment, how much you know, money, ammunition, that NATO is running, is running dry, tapped out, and Ukraine's losing, and losing badly. So what do they do? Uh, they can keep sort of doubling down, and with each passing day, the Ukrainian military is degraded. It's, it's, not, it's not strengthened. So, this NATO's in trouble, and they, they tried to put the, the best face on this. You know, this is that classic putting lipstick on a pig. Uh, maybe a little pretty, but still a pig. And NATO is not more unified. It's less unified. It's split over what to do with respect to Ukraine. You have countries like Bulgaria and Hungary, albeit the smaller uh, members of NATO, saying, you know, we're not giving any more uh, weapons or support to Ukraine, uh, where some of the other countries are saying, oh, yeah, we're going to, we promise to keep pumping um, uh, money and material in, except as Joe Biden admitted to CNN the other day, uh, 
we've run out. That's why we're having to send cluster munitions because we no longer have conventional artillery shells. So we're going to send these uh, artillery shells that c contain all these little bomblets that uh, if they fall to the ground, don't explode, can be picked up by a child years later and have it blow off their hands, legs, or arms. So you know, you, you've got that mess going on. And uh, they give these assurances to Ukraine, oh, well, but we'll, we'll have your back. But there, there's no treaty obligation to do so. And then finally, uh, you had Turkey. And, and Turkey basically betrayed Russia uh, in its behavior. I mean, it, it's been the hallmark of uh, Erdogan. And I think you'll see uh, the, the Russians take some steps against Erdogan that's going to make his position uh, much, much less secure. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I want to I want to address that. Uh, just this morning, I was on with Colonel Douglas McGregor. Mm -hmm. and we were talking about how, uh, you know, Ukraine, whether with Zelensky's permission or not, they have been crossing over into Russia, attacking parts of Moscow. But we talked about how there's a major difference between sending in one or two small drones versus hitting Moscow with a ballistic missile or a long-range missile. If that happens, uh, how do you see Russia retaliating if they are suddenly hit with 10, 20, 30 long-range missiles in the middle of the night? Uh, well, first of all, I don't think that will happen simply because of Russia's uh, ample, robust air defense system. It would shoot those down before they even had a chance to reach it. But if they even if they were launched, it would ne necessitate an escalation of military response by Russia. You know, Russia's they've been trying to do a controlled special military operation. They have not declared war. They've not done a full mobilization of Russian society and they've not thrown everything that they have into the conflict. They've been somewhat controlled. But we have seen evidence over the last week or two that they are stepping up their attacks and going after the Ukrainians at the very same time that the Ukrainian effort ability to sustain operations is being weakened and weakened significantly. Um, so any kind of attack like that inside, uh, n not just along the uh, original border of uh, Ukraine and Russia, but going into Moscow and hitting Moscow with a large cruise missile of some sort and causing significant damage, it is uh, it's going to require a robust response from the Russians. I, I said, right, I've said, I wrote last night that I, I anticipate that in in the coming weeks that we could see Russia begin to shoot down uh, the U.S. Predator drones, the the other drones that are used in uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance activities. Um, uh, they might even go after some of the fixed wing aircraft that are collecting intelligence. Uh, before they do that, I think they'll. They'll disrupt, if not destroy, the Starlink system of Elon Musk. So, you know, the Russia up to this point has been taking some, you know, taking some blows, but none of them fatal. None of them. There've been more irritants than uh, uh, serious. But, but I think that's changing now. Uh, that, that Russia recognizes the West is keen on destroying it, and it's going to have to protect itself. Yeah. When when you say. Uh, ramping up their attack on Reaper drones and, and satellites and all that. Are you specifically talking about over Ukraine or are you talking about down in the Black Sea? Uh, uh, down in the Black area? Yeah, up to this point, the United States has been careful to keep its uh, drones out in international uh, uh, airspace. Um, and I think that we're, we're going to reach a point where Russia is going to take them out because of. This, these strikes have come from the West, have hit inside of Russia, and have provided uh, a cause, a, a cause a belly that uh, Russia can legally respond under the UN Charter. Okay, I know. I know. Uh, you know when war is officially declared. I didn't go to West Point or anything, but I know two of the first things you do is you wipe out communication and you wipe out infrastructure. It seems like uh, Russia has been focused on wiping out the infrastructure of Ukraine, but you believe the next step could be further wiping out that communication with NATO nations? 
Yeah, but well, I think I think one of the things that Russia Russia's been cautious about attacking these uh, joint operation centers, where you'll have NATO advisors side by side with Ukrainian officers and, and enlisted personnel coordinating operations and developing intelligence. That Russia's been cautious about hitting those because I believe Russia has in human sources in those locations. So you're not gonna you're not gonna bomb and blow it up if you've got a human source there because you know what's going on. And so it, uh, you don't want to make yourself blind. Uh, but I think there may come a moment where Russia will feel compelled, but it'd be politically compelled because of the domestic reaction and anger if uh, if uh, any of these Ukrainian long distance strikes come to pass uh, that will require that kind of uh, destructive response. So they'll take out. They've already been ta weakened, taking out the air defense systems. That that has been underway, and uh, that, that's why Russia can fly with impunity right now all along the line of con contact, uh, something that it was not doing six months ago. Okay, wow, interesting. Uh, in the last few days, President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine uh, openly mocked former President Donald Trump, saying, oh, you, you think you could end this war in 24 hours uh, if it were possible, Joe Biden would end it in five minutes. Uh, but both of you are going to require that Ukraine give up territory in order to end the war, which we're not willing to do. Why do you think that uh, he was willing to openly mock Trump uh, versus Biden? And then secondly, uh, is, there, is there any truth to that? Are, are they going to have to concede territory in order to make this war go away? Ukraine doesn't have a choice in this. I mean, the, the reality is uh, Zelensky uh, is a delusional cocaine addict. And let's, you know, let's deal with him for what he is. A uh, career comedian uh, with a reputation for using cocaine to keep alert and, on, and, and, and focus. And, but the, the tactical reality, it's, it's, it's very simple. Uh, the Ukrainians are on, they're in the process now of, of exterminating their third army. They, the, the army that existed a year ago at the start of the special military operation in February 2022 is gone. The senior officers, the, the, the colonels, the lieutenant colonels who were uh, providing leadership in, in the brigades and battalions, they're gone. So they had to rebuild a second time. Uh, that army was operating uh, last fall and it came to an end basically with let's mark the end of the battle at Bakhmut. Now they're on the third army. These guys are not as well trained and they're already faltering in their ability to conduct any kind of large maneuvers at all, much like even small maneuvers are they're getting hammered. They haven't even made it to the first line of the, the Russian defenses. They're, they're out in that gray zone. So the, the manpower shortage is it's in a death spot because Ukraine does not have the ability to recruit people that are going to be put in extended training programs so that they can develop the skills they need in order to operate on the battlefield. Then you add to that, they're running out of ammunition, principally for artillery shells and mortar shells. They have no fixed wing combat aircraft that can come up and provide close air support to any Ukrainian troops trying to advance on Russian lines. They have no rotary wing uh, combat aircraft that can come up and provide a similar uh, support. Their, their mobile air defense has been eliminated and their mobile artillery capability is quite limited along with tanks that are being blown up with regularity. So it's, you, you know, this, not my opinion, this is what's taking place on the ground. So under what scenario is Ukraine going to, quote, recapture anything? They haven't recaptured anything where the Russians had uh, an embedded defensive force. Uh, the, the retreat from uh, Kharkiv last September was a tactical withdrawal necessitated because the Russians were short of troops. And so they you know, pulled the troops out rather than putting them into a meat grinder. Uh, the, the giving up Kherson uh, as well in uh, what was that, December, uh, that was necessitated because 
uh, Surovikin, General Surovikin, recognized that if he left his troops on the west side of the riverbank, that they could be flooded, cut off, and it would be very difficult to resupply them. So, you, you know, you don't put troops in that kind of risky position unless you can ensure that you could have them supplied and sustained. So we withdrew those. Apart from that, we don't have a single incidence of, uh, the, right, of the Ukrainians actually capturing and taking back significant territory. So this is, this is just more bombast from Zelensky. Uh, and it may be, I'd, I'd suggest, a, a cocaine-induced high led him to do it. Yeah, it, it's almost like um, he's, he's trying to set NATO up to come into the war because mm -hmm. if, if the United States especially continues to say, well, we're, we're you know, General Milley and Lloyd Austin, they say, well, we're going to let Ukraine decide how this war ends and we're going to let them decide what winning or losing or, or, or you know, uh, negotiations look like. But then they keep throwing in, we want Crimea back. We want this territory. Like you say, they're not getting it back. So yeah. who, who do they think is going to come in and return it? Putin? Yeah, well, the, what, what they're hoping is, uh, you correctly noted, that they're trying to create uh, a reason for NATO to intervene. They, they're counting on that as their only hope. And it's a vain hope because NATO is militarily not equipped to fight and beat the Russians. They don't have the troops. Um, they don't have the armor. They don't have the artillery. And they certainly don't have the artillery shells necessary. Uh, what, what we witnessed is the deindustrialization of both the United States and, and Western Europe. Uh, Germany used to be able to count on, be count, counted on to provide uh, some of these supplies, but the with the start of the special military operation, the sanctions, rupture of relations with Russia, uh, Germany's in a, in a death spiral economically. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's, uh, you know, what are, even if they manage to rope NATO into the conflict and get them involved with uh, trying to kill Russians, the, the, the Russians will, de will destroy NATO. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Yeah. Well, and I think most of Europe uh, were still close enough to World War II and even World War I that they, they just do not want another European land war that lasts many, many years and wipes out tens of millions of humans. And they're, they're just not committed to it. And, and I can completely understand right. why. Um, switching gears here, um, do you think the... Uh, the beef between Putin and Prigozhin has been settled, uh, and also, was there was Prigozhin possibly set up by uh, believing that maybe the CIA or MI6 might have his back if he were able to get close enough to Moscow? I've been reading a little bit about that, but there's so much propaganda; it's hard to know exactly yeah. what's right. Uh, I believe. Uh, that Prigozhin was part of, I'll call it, a Russian Maskarovka operation. But by that, I'm not suggesting that uh, Prigozhin's activities and anger towards Russia was entirely staged or fabricated. So let's understand. Number one, Prigozhin has been used by Russian intelligence as a shiny object to, a, to distract American intelligence and Ameri American military planners, as well as the public. This, uh, there is a Western obsession with Prigozhin, and it really started coming into the fore last September. Because uh, if you remember prior to that, there wasn't a lot of, Prigozhin and his, uh, the Wagner group played little role in the propaganda being circulated. That, the previous focus was on the Akhmat Battalion, you know, the, the Chechen Muslims, when they took over Mariupol with the cries of Allahu Akbar, you know, that was the focus. And then they faded away, and then all of a sudden, here comes the Wagner Group, and the West focuses on that. And it's very fascinating to look at the zero coverage that's provided to the rest of the Russian military. It's like there's no other 
no other unit, no other activity on the yeah. Russian side. It's all Wagner all the time. So I, I think that was a deliberate uh, uh, intelligence ploy uh, by the Russians. It's, it's, it's sort of akin to if, you, if you've read about what uh, the Allies did on the eve of D-Day, that they had George S. Patton set up a ghost army. And they did ghost communications, and they had fake tanks and fake trucks and inflatables. And the Germans really thought that that was going to be the main invasion force. That complete distraction. I think that's part of what's going on here with Prigozhin. But there is a history. So Prigozhin has been, uh, think of him as Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, uh, General Dynamics. He's a military contractor. Only his job primarily was providing food. And some of the reports are the food was not very good. So, you know, lousy chef. Uh, but then on top of that, he was direct. He was the director of the Internet Research Agency. Well, that's that is a, an information operation, a covert action. That, that's tied to Russian intelligence. So right there, you got this one tie with uh, Wagner and Russian intelligence. And then he became sort of the front guy for the Wagner Group, which was set up by Russian military intelligence, the GRU. In 2018, uh, Wagner, uh, or Prigozhin, cut a deal with a Syrian warlord who wanted to get access to the Conoco oil in Kurdish territory. It meant they had to cross the river to get to it. Well, that oil field was defended by U.S. Special Operations Forces. And at that time, there was daily communication between the U.S. military commander uh, and uh, Qatar, what they called the Joint Air Operations Center, and then uh, the Russian counterparts. So the Americans call up the Russian counterparts because uh, what Wagner did was they got paid off, they took money under the table to go in and attack that oil field, take it over. And that was the deal. And this was Prigozhin running operations on the side to make himself rich. And I fully believe that in, the, in doing that, he was also providing payoffs to the intelligence officers in GRU who are supposed to run him and manage him. Um, so they cross over, they're, they're attacking this, mili this U.S. military outpost. Uh, the uh, U.S. calls up the Russians and say, hey, are these your guys that have crossed over? The Russian military commanders go, no, not our guys, because it wasn't an official Russian action. It was an independent uh, job being carried out by uh, Wagner under with Prigozhin's uh, direction. Uh, a lot of those Wagner guys got killed that day. So that is a, a source of anger that festered with Prigozhin. And I fully believe at some point uh, last fall, he had contact with Ukrainian uh, military intelligence because he, he had had an experience of previous ties uh, in Kiev. And they hooked him up with someone from British MI6. And uh, at that point, uh, the West became convinced that they had recruited Prigozhin as somebody who was going to work for Western intelligence. Now, I don't know at what point after that that Prigozhin was informed by R Russian counterintelligence at the FSB. We know about your contacts. We know what you're doing. You're either going to cooperate with us or you're going to die. It's that simple. You don't have a choice. And Prigozhin, being a, you know, a, the greedy, fat bastard that he is, uh, opted for staying alive. Uh, so at that point, that you begin to, uh, he begins doing, you know, acting out to support the narrative that he is really pissed at the, the general staff and the minister of defense, and he's going to uh, betray them, or, you know, willing to betray them. So he has all these emotional outbursts that are widely reported on Telegram. Now, Stephen, think about this. We're told in the West that Vladimir Putin is this authoritarian in total control of his government and any dissident, I mean, he's assassinating people right and left that are dissidents around him and talk bad about him. <laughs> and yet he tolerates these kinds of outbursts from Prigozhin. And then added on top of it, we know from the leaked documents of that Jack Teixeira, that airman in Massachusetts, who posted on Discord, that uh, Prigozhin delivered intelligence 
about Russian troop locations to his Western handlers. Well, that's one way to establish your bona fides. You pass intelligence that the West can corroborate and say, oh yeah, this is, this is rock solid. But think about it. Russia would gladly let Prigozhin pass that because the United States already knew where the troops were located because they have satellites and fixed wing surveillance aircraft. I mean, it's like sending, I likened it to sending three truckloads of snow to Eskimos in February, okay? <laughs> or, or, or sending three, three truckloads of snow to Park City in January. Yeah. Okay, it's, it's not needed. Yeah. Uh, but it established Prigozhin's bona fides. Now, this is the reason I believe that that is the proper backstory, is that Prigozhin's still alive and still walking around. Uh, and that his commanders were not rounded up. Uh, he played a role. Now, people say, well, wait, uh, the Wagner troops killed uh, some uh, Russian airmen. Yeah, that's true. And I think that was an unintended consequence of this operation. Um, you know, if you're going to, uh, the West was genuinely convinced that Prigozhin was their guy and was going to attack and take out Putin. They really believed it. That's why they were salivating on that Friday, the 24th as, or 23rd, as all of this started to unfold. And note that Prigozhin initiated this action on the very day that a large-scale NATO military exercise was concluding. And I believe one of the reasons for the timing of that was it did put NATO aircraft in a position where they could potentially be called upon to provide support to Prigozhin's forces if he succeeded in his mission. But the thing blew up so quickly. The, the Russians had already pre-positioned troops. They were not scrambling, having to call, come save us, come, you know, alarm, alarm. No, the, 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 the Ahmed Battalion was already pre-positioned and ready to you know, at least show the image of you know, we're crushing this rebellion. Yeah. And uh, Prigozhin didn't even have a viable plan for how his, his 3,000 troops were gonna get from Rostov-on-Don up to Moscow, 720 mile trip. Uh, they didn't have aircraft to do it. So if they're going to get in trucks and do it, you know, I don't know if you've been on any road trips with your family, but imagine, you know, you got 12 people, 12 guys per truck with all their backpacks and, and, and firearms and ammunition. And when you got 3000 troops, that means you need roughly 250 trucks. And that makes a convoy if they're really tightly uh, grouped together about uh, two miles, over two miles long. And just, you know, think about the time involved of stopping at the gas station to let 3,000 guys out to go tinkle yeah. and to fill up the gas. I mean, it was just, it was yeah. laughable. Yeah. But, but the West bought it. And I know for a fact from two different friends of mine who still have access to current CIA employees that they're all saying, we got played. We were, this was deception. We got played. Cloak and dagger spy stuff. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Right in front of our eyes. Okay, uh, fi final question. I know how valuable your time is. Um, so, just in the last couple of days, former Russian President Medvedev and former U.S. President Donald Trump have both said, We are moving closer and closer to World War III. Yep. Why is nobody trying to seek peace with Russia? Why is Joe Biden? continuing to push for war more than peace uh do you do you think there's any truth to what these two former presidents are saying or are these just really good talking points for upcoming elections no i i think they're both right i mean this is Stephen. this is the scariest time in my life uh so i you know i was eight years old when the cuban missile crisis uh, erupted and uh, even during that, even when the United States and, and, and the Soviet Union came co so close to an actual nuclear conflict, there were still the t we were still talking to each other and, and talking to each other in ways that were not going to be, we're not insulting and we're not going to aggravate the situation. That's not the case today, uh, particularly with, uh, with Biden. Uh, the, the Biden administration seems intent on pissing everybody off. You know, Russia and China, and what what's really happened out of this uh, 
uh, effort to isolate and destroy Russia is we the West has now committed suicide with respect to the West to U.S. control of the international world order. Those international rules that we used to control and dictate are now in the process of being dismantled. Russia and China, in terms of their, I, I believe it is both a military and political and economic alliance, are in the process of transforming the international order, and the U.S. ability to control events has, has been rapidly eroded. So it's in that it's in that situation that I see not so much Russia starting a nuclear war because Russia recognizes better than anybody in the West what the consequences of that are because they prepared for it. They they were over the last couple of years they refurbished their urban uh, bomb shelters that you know they use a lot of the subway system and it's it's stocked with with food, uh, with water, with uh, bedding. Uh, with toilet facilities, so that if people had to go underground, they could go underground. On top of that, they've got a robust anti-ballistic missile defense system. The United States doesn't have either of those. So it's only if Russia is pushed into a corner uh, would they, I think, feel the need to make that kind of uh, retaliation or response. So I don't think this was just, uh, you know, tr Trump bloviating and Medvedev shooting his mouth off. I, I think they both accurately recognize the gravity of the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, offline, I, I talk to friends and I tell them, listen, <laughs> one missile into Moscow and all of our lives look different. The trajectory of the planet looks different. And they're like, oh, no, it, it, you know, Russia's weak. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, you've been watching too much CNN. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> like, you know, I think about it, that. We in the United States have never been attacked since 1812 by a foreign military force of any size or, or, or import. Um, Russia has been facing those kinds of invasions for hundreds of years and fighting them off and prevailing. So it's, you know, and with, with the fact that Russia lost 27 million people between civilians and troops in World War II. Uh, out of a population then of about 160 million, you know that every family lost somebody uh, that they knew, a close family member or friend. The United States didn't even get a bloody nose in World War II. We lost a total of 472,000 troops, roughly, Army, Air, Army Air Corps, Navy, Marines. That's in both theaters. That's in the Pacific, and that's in Europe and in North Africa. All of that combined, we only lost 472,000. The, the Russians lost twice that at the Battle of Stalingrad. So, you know, we are in a completely different fantasy land with these uh, d dismissing the capabilities of Russia. Uh, what, what's so ironic about this is which country has had to rely uh, on the other in order to transport its astronauts to the International Space Station. Oh, that's right. That would be the United States has relied on Russia for almost 20 years to haul its astronauts to outer space because we lost our ability to build rockets that could do that mission. Think about that. And yet, Russia's the weak one militarily. Russia has hypersonic missiles. We don't. And uh, we, we hope to have some maybe online that uh, by the end of the year, maybe, uh, but the, the ability to produce them in any amount is not guaranteed. Uh, so, I mean, just you walk down the electronic warfare capabilities. The United States has virtually no electronic warfare capabilities. Russia has AMP. It would just keep going down the list. Yeah. So. Uh, you're right. That is, it's insanity in the part of this, and it's bipartisan. This is not. This is not just a bunch of stupid Democrats. It's a, also a bunch of stupid Republicans. Bipartisan stupidity. Yeah, yeah. Now you bring up an interesting point. You know, the country that uh, supposedly made it to the moon first is now hitchhiking with yeah. the with the Russians to get back to space because we can't we can't even get our own people into space. Well. Larry Johnson, this has been uh, a fascinating discussion. I hope to have you on the, the show again. 
if people want to learn more about you or, or be kept up to date with uh, you know being filtered through your mind, uh, tell us your website and how people can uh, stay in contact. Sure, my website is sonar21.com, S-O-N-A-R-21.com, stands for Son of the New American Revolution. I took that title not because I'm trying to incite a revolution, but um, I have 28 ancestors that fought in the American Revolution, and some of them gave their lives in that effort. So I am committed to promoting a nation that still believes in freedom and liberty and personal responsibility. Great. Thank you. Sonar 21. Uh, Larry, thank you so much again for coming on today's show.